TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are <clears throat> not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, man. Right behind me, you see it. Spotify. Ooh, not the Spotify. This is a warning. May you need it, may not, man. But this is overcoming my 20-year addiction to sad Gaza. This is 20 minutes with Lad Bible, man. <clears throat> I think you know it's weird. I think we all have at one point have had a weird addiction with something to do sexually, but like maybe it's to the hub.com. Maybe it's to your palm or your hand. Maybe it's <laughs> maybe it's to your two little fingers and twirling it the bean. Maybe like we don't like we've all had some type of form, right? Not all of us. I don't want to speak for everybody, but a large percentage of the world. But let's let's see what it's really, what it's really like. My childhood was, I'd say, quite hard in um, a lot of ways. My mom was a single parent. You know, she was a, a mm, great okay, mom and everything okay. like that. Um, just you know, doing her best, but my dad was too ill to work and things, so she did everything on her own, you know. My dad had, um, well, he still has uh, schizophrenia, so he was in and out of psychiatric hospital, um, and, yeah, he, like, tried to kill himself a couple of times. I mean, when I look back now, I think that's probably where like my insecurities and like low self-esteem come from po possibly unconsciously you you just think well what's wrong with me how old were you when and i and I, you know i always be saying certain stuff to, like oh no dad did this no mom did this but no it be it really be that you know what I'm saying? It really be that for dads and daughters. Like what she just said, self low self esteem. What is a dad instilling their daughter? Self esteem. You the first man that's gonna tell your daughter she beautiful. You love her. This, that, and the third. Like gotta be there to do that type stuff. And you think you started to play? You, you just think, well, what's wrong? And with I don't me? know her life. How story. old were you when you think you started to become aware of your dad's schizophrenia? Um, I always knew really because. He, he was in and out of hospital from when him and my mum di divorced and stuff like that. So, but yeah, I always knew because he'd like, you know, talk to himself a lot and he was really paranoid and jealous and things like that. I didn't grow up getting that love that I needed from my dad, even though he loved me and I l loved him. It he wasn't yeah. the, I suppose, secure, protective love that, that you, as I guess, need as a child. Um, and I think I found a way early to, you know, I, 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 I think I knew really early that I had like a, that, that women had a sexual, like it was a, something men responded to, you know. I mean, I lost my virginity really early. I was like 12, so obviously Damn. that's quite young. I think that kind of sexualized me at a young age, if you know what I mean. So I, I think I saw... That's why I will never refuse. I thought, you know, you, you, the world is going to expose itself to your children, rather you present or not. You know what I'm saying? But I'll do my best to not let my male, my daughter or my son, when I have one, like, grow up too fast. Like, take it easy. You know what I'm saying? The, you know, that's something that men like. And I just think I, I just realized that early and I just kept capitalizing on it, if you know what I mean, because it made me feel in like in control and like I had power over something instead of feeling powerless, if that makes sense. Yeah, cause and really would you say, was it about the age of 12 that you started to become aware of your sexuality? I think it was younger than that, I really do, if I'm honest, eight or nine or something like that, probably. I got bullied at school. Um, around that time when I was starting to become sexual, I guess because I was sexual before everyone else, people didn't, I don't know, like people called me a slag and things like that and I got bullied really badly at school. How did your 
relationship with your sexuality progress from that point? Yeah, it just just when I guess more and more this is extreme as time went on, if that makes sense. Just I knew because that is like the truth of it all. You know what I'm saying? If you get extra, if you get active before anybody else in school. They're going to make fun of you, at least until you get to high school. Then it's going to die down. Like, <laughs> I knew that there was something not right. Dream as time went on, if that makes sense. Just, I knew that there was something not right with me because I just had sex with so many more people than, than like all my friends and things like that. Wait, wait, I think I was just count? looking for that connection. I think mm -hmm. that's what a lot of addiction is. is just, you're just trying to find that connection with, with that real connection, I suppose, that you're just craving. And did you have relationships in these years at school? Uh, yeah, I had uh, a boyfriend at, um, at one point. I always had like relationships. I think I found it hard to be on my own. But then very on-off relationships, very unstable relationships. So I had um, been in a relationship then would split up and then I'd go on like a massive spree of just like having sex with loads of people then we'd get back together and, you know, that kind of thing. Hey, one thing I always it. was is... Being in a relationship then would split up and then I'd go on like a massive spree of just like having sex with loads of people then we'd get back together and you know that oh, kind of God. thing. One thing I always was is, is honest with the people I was with like I wouldn't like stay and be unfaithful but I'd just leave and then go and do that and then go back and it was like. When I was in high school I did that too but I didn't think it was anything abnormal like instead of cheating and having that label on me as a cheater like I, let me just break up with you and go do me real quick and then we can work it out and kind of come back i used to do that i feel like that that happens like that's common is it not like that backwards and forwards kind of thing but i just you know find a way to attract people who just you know weren't emotionally available i think at what point did, do you think you started to realise that perhaps you had an unhealthy relationship with sex? Um, Later? I mean, when I was younger, it was just really fun. And I just, it, it was really fun at first. You know, I loved it. I was just going and doing loads of crazy things and having loads of new experiences. And that side of it was, was really fun. And in the beginning, like it always is, I suppose, with every addiction. Um, I knew. I still feel like her movements are very. You know what I'm saying? Like anybody else watching, like, like they still feel a little bit. It's the attracting, I think, bad, you know, people. I think that's when I knew because, um, I mean, I, my life was a bit out of control. Okay. Any, anyway, but I was happy with it in my twenties because I didn't have any responsibilities, you know. Uh, but then I got pregnant with my first son. I, I just instantly fell in love with him. And I think that's you out. the only time that I've been truly, truly happy for um, the first uh, seven and a bit weeks of having him. But then he, he passed away. Dang. So that was Oh, my very gosh. Tra dramatic, traumatizing, scarred you. I'm sorry to hear that. R.I.P. Hard because I think after that is when I think well, wow. I noticed my addiction oh. got quite bad. Yeah. I mean, I got diagnosed with PTSD after that anyway. Um, he, yeah, because he, he was in my arms when he died and stuff like that. And, what happened? Um, How did he pass? So, yeah, so, so after that, like, it just, life was pretty bad for a, a long time. I think that's when I really started to, like, get really codependent, you know, and try and reach out, uh, try to reach out for just, yeah, relationships. And then I went on loads of, you know, sex binges again. After you lost your son, at its worst point, how many times a week were you having sex? How many different um, were you sleeping with? Oh. A lot. I don't know. Please throw a guess out. Throw a number out there. Uh, I'm curious. Like 20.
something like that. Yeah, like in a week. It wasn't necessarily the, the sex that was the, the most like damaging thing because I, I was always pretty careful in terms of protection and things like that. I was quite smart in that way, I suppose. It was more the, the codependency side of it. I think that's what ultimately is behind it is you, you, you're dependent on other people, but then you don't want that commitment at the same time. So like you, if you have sex with different people, you don't have to get too close. You, yeah, you don't want people to get too close, but then you're so scared of being alone. Um, and I think like if, it, if you're not getting that attention this all the deep. time, that's like your fix, if you know what I mean, like you need other people to tell you that you're alright because you don't feel it yourself. If you choose people who aren't right for you, then I don't know, you, you don't have to commit yourself. I think that's ultimately what's at the core of it. I think it's you're scared to let yourself be vulnerable and love properly and be loved because you don't feel like you deserve it. And how was your emotional well-being during these years? Oh, bad. <laughs> yeah, really bad. Just up and down. Up and down, like, all the time. Um, I mean, I've been diagnosed with BPD as well, which can cause ups and downs and volatile relationships. And I think a lot of people who have um, sex addiction or love addiction have got BPD, I would say. If you sense a relationship ending, it could trigger you into, I don't know, like a suicidal behaviour. Suicidal behaviours is, is a thing as well on there. Um, or even thinking about suicide a lot and that kind of thing. Yeah, Gemini. Um, but yeah, it's, it's I, I, would, I would say that most people who, who have this addiction have got that, if not all. Did you feel any notions of guilt or shame around yeah, yeah, because I put myself in dangerous situations and situations that I didn't, you know, like, I didn't want to have sex with certain people and I still did and things like that. Were you honest with the people in your life about what you were going through? Um, I think people in my life know. Yeah, I think they do. Um, I've always been honest with my mom and things like that and she's... Yeah, she accepts me for who I am and things. When I used to go to the addict groups, there were lots of people who were hiding lots of things, and I think that's quite common. But I think, because I've always been quite a brazen person anyway, do you know, who puts herself out there. I think because I've been like that for so long, just I didn't really feel like I needed to hide anything. What do you think addiction is? It's, it's, it's a powerlessness, isn't it? And I think a feeling of you don't deserve to be happy sometimes. I think that's underlying sometimes um, and also I think there's an element of like punishing yourself as well. You, you mentioned your father at the beginning I suppose at this point it was still searching for something in that relationship that was lacking. Um, yeah I think that's ultimately what we're doing for the rest of our adult lives is trying to heal those wounds from childhood and I think relationships give us an opportunity to do that. For how many years do you think that the yeah, she's she's really cooking at the same time as she's telling us this story? Like it's a necessary story to hear, but like you need to be in your children's lives. It's very important. So the people that be like, "Oh man, they ain't gonna remember me." They, they, they. Yes, they are. And if you come late, it's better coming late than never. It's important, man. Like parenthood is 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 a uh, there's a learning curve. You're always learning during parenthood. You nobody's ever going to be the perfect parent. As long as you're present and you're trying, it, it's 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 going to make all of the difference in your child's life. This this kind of addiction was consuming a lot of your life. I wouldn't say I'm cured or anything like that, but um, I'd say. I'd say probably 20 years, like, I'd say it's only recently, you know, in the last five years or whatever, where it's, I've, I've really taken it seriously to, you know. 
And in those 20 years, what, what would you say has been the hardest point for you? Um, just the judgment from other people, I think, is one of the worst things. Um, I think people judge sexuality in, in a different way. I think it's wrong to, ju to judge any addict because nine times out of ten, the person who's judging is addicted to something else. I think sex is, is, yeah. is frowned upon and it's made to be this shameful thing if you've had sex with loads of people. Why do you think it is viewed differently to other addictions? I don't know. I think they're all, they're all pretty... I think they're all quite judged, I think. I, I wouldn't say it's more... I just think it's probably a lot... There's, it's, you know, sex is something that people, most people, have and enjoy, isn't it? Whereas you can't just cut, cut sex out like you could do with alcohol or drugs. I suppose it's a bit more... I think some people probably think it doesn't exist or, you know, it's not a real addiction. And so that journey to um, shifting away your behaviour, how, you, how did you start that? Um, well, I started off with some uh, questionnaires and then I, I started going to like uh, groups, group therapy. Um, and had like a sponsor and stuff like that. Um, then I had a period of like nearly three months where I was on my own and I was celibate and that was really hard. <laughs> yeah, like it was, I got like flu symptoms and Damn. it was really strange how it... You uh, had the shakes, you had the withdrawal symptoms and everything from this? Um, affected me. Like, you wouldn't think that something like that would affect you, you know, just from not having sex, but that's how it made me feel. Um, and I just, I'd lost my crutch, so my emotions were really bad. Like, like for, like, I was just crying all the time. I felt really suicidal. I'd, like, I didn't have, you know, just anything to, numb, to, to take that pain away. I'm a big believer in therapy. Um, yeah, that's helped a lot as well. I think everyone should have therapy um, because... True, there's always something in somebody's life that's going, that's making something overactive in your head. So therapy is a good way to just talk about it. It just, yeah, it just helps you make sense of what you've been through and gets it all out there, you know. And how long ago was it that you started to build away from the addiction? Um, well, since I met my partner now, who's called Matt, um, he, yeah, I, I just knew I wanted to be committed. Um, and it, it's, it was really weird for me being committed and not, because I'd always had these on-off, on-off relationships. So I was like, committed. And then, but when you're committed to like one person, yeah, you, you've got nowhere to run or hide. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so all my vulnerabilities came up then. So it, right. that in itself has been challenging, but I'm so glad that I've stuck by that and st stood with it because it just gets better and better and things come up to be healed all the time. You feel like the addiction kind of never really goes away. It's always going to be part of you. If you have urges and impulses now, how have you learned to, to manage well, that? Well, I mean, I'm quite lucky. Like, we have a really good sex life in, like, in my relationship. So we're, we're sexually compatible. I think we're quite matched. So y'all both, <laughs> yeah, you found you want to match your energy is what you said. And he always ready to go is what you saying. Okay. I think that's important, like, oh, to find someone. I think that's important in general for relationships, to find someone who you, you're quite matched with on that level, I think. If I don't feel like, it, for whatever reason, we've, we've not had as much sex as what we normally do, or I do start to get, like, really panicky, and I'm like, right, I need attention, or, or I also, I think, like, people have, like, a couple of addictions or a couple of things that they find comfortable and mine's food as well so I just end up eating loads when I'm not having enough sex and then I put weight on so that's a bit annoying and you can recognize it in yourself when you feel yeah I think you've got yeah, don't forget that's why I think that everybody has some type of an addiction man like 95% of everybody
Whether it be video games, whether it be food, whether it be anything. I resist that urge to go into your old behaviours. You've just got to find a way to talk to yourself, whether you talk yourself around or you just say, you know, come on, this is just that. You know, you, you don't have to act upon that. You can be strong and just, like, you know, being friends with yourself, I suppose, is just speaking to yourself in a nice way. Like, we can do that. We speak to ourselves all the time, mm -hmm. don't we? So it may as well be something empowering. <laughs> And with addiction, a lot of people say that, you know, people are born with an addictive personality. Yeah. Do you believe that or do you think it's something that... I think uh, some people are. But then I think there's other people who develop it just through their upbringing who haven't, aren't born like that, but just become like that because they've seen their parents do it or, you know, something's happening in childhood that just, where they f feel worthless for whatever reason. How would you want people's perception of sexuality to shift in society generally? Um, just, I just wish people would stop shaming other people for sexuality. I don't think it's fair. Do you think that it's true that more men are addicted to sex than women? Um, Man, I think it's an even split, 50-50. <laughs> if we got to quantify it, I think it's an even thing. Women are just more... You, you, women are less out there with it. Men, you gonna know. No, I don't think so. Yes, I, I yeah, wouldn't I say so. so. I don't think men and women are as different as what we're led, made out to believe. That's my personal belief. Um, I think we're more s similar than what we think. One of the indicators of sex and love addiction is staying in or returning to an abusive relationship, you know, and women can be just as abusive as what men can. I believe that too. So I think, I think, no, I, I wouldn't say so. I know men in general watch more porn and things like that, but that's just one part of it. Women are... Women got it up here. They got this. You ever heard of a spank bank? Women got that. They memorize everything. They go back to a feeling they had in their head. They recall that. It can be more codependent. The needs and the problems the same both ways, I think. And why have you decided to share your experiences? Um, I want other people to know that they can um, have the life they want. The, you know, don't wait, spend all your time just in that addiction. Like it's addiction distracts you from your life purpose and what you're here to achieve and do you know you've got that energy f to, to go and be successful in whatever that is that you're meant to do so sometimes we just indulge in these addictions because you know we're masking that pain rather than just dealing with it when you stop distracting yourself with that you can go and do what what you want to do you'll have so much more time and energy and you'll feel more clear and pure in yourself and you can feel like you deserve you know what it is that you really want and you can go out and get it how is your relationship with your dad now oh yeah yeah good like he's he's in like a home now and he's you know cared for and he's on his medication you know yeah you know he's got an illness that he didn't ask for and he's right. you know um as, as upsetting as some of my childhood experiences are when I think about them now, like, he just, it's not his fault, you know what I mean? It's just his, he, just he had an illness and, you know, I can't hate him for that. I love him. I've always loved him. And with your sons, will you be honest with them about your experiences? and your When they're older? Yeah. Um, I think so, yeah. I, I mean, I try and be like as honest and open with my kids as I can be because I want them to know that, um, yeah, that, that they can overcome things and, you know, it's all right if, if yeah. My son, uh, my eldest son, he is very much like me and um, so I think he'll, he'll have something, you know, it w is, yeah. So I think he'll be glad that he can help ask me for advice and things, you know. And looking back and I suppose at that younger version of, of Laurie that was yeah. really struggling um, all those years ago, what would you say to her? 
that you're stronger than what you think. Um, yeah, that it's not your fault and you're not responsible for anybody else. What would I tell her? Just that she's loved and that, that you, she doesn't, it's not about getting that love from anyone else. You can get that from you and your relationship with, 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 with God and the world. And I think that's ultimately the most important relationship, I think, is, is that. So I think that's what I tell her. <laughs>